us free, hope us souls redeemed to tell, for the Lord our God reigns, for the Lord our God reigns, Jesus Emmanuel, he has set us free, hope us souls redeemed to tell, for the Lord our God reigns, for the Lord our God reigns, for the Lord Hey, good morning. Welcome to Twickenham. Thanks for coming out to be with us today. It is nasty and chilly outside this morning, but warm and cozy in here. Glad you're with us. If you're a guest, thanks for coming out to be with us today. It is always a weird thing to visit a new church. So if you're visiting, I totally get that, but it's okay because this is a weird church. You'll be fine. Glad you're here. There's a card on the seat in front of you. You can uh, fill that out and place it in the collection plate when it passes a little bit later on. And if there is a prayer request that you'd like to make, please do that, and then we'll pray about that this week. Just glad you're here. Thanks for coming. You guys want to come on up? Um, there, is, uh, uh, there was a, a, a woman who lived, I think, in the 1400s named Julian of Norwich, and she was called an anchorite. Um, the first part of that kind of gives you an idea about what she might have been like. She was anchored. Her personality was anchored. Her spirit was anchored in God. And she lived in a little apartment attached to a church building. And when I say apartment, don't think the kind of place you'd live or I'd live. It's, it was just a shanty little thing that she lived there and stayed there all the time. And she'd had a lot of struggle in her life, a lot of pain, a lot of sorrow, a lot of loss. And people would come from miles around to hear what she had to say because she had had these visions of God. She'd walked with God so long and had this, these visions of God and shared with people what she'd seen. One of her most famous quotes, you're going to hear this and you're going to go, I could have said that. But when, you, when it comes from where she was coming from, her background, it was so meaningful because of all the loss and struggle she'd had. She said, all things shall be well. And all things shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. So if you're going through a hard time right now, would you, can those words just bless you, that all things shall be well? We had an anchorite of sorts among us for a few years here at Twickenham, uh, a very special lady who is about this tall, when I stood next to Jean Jones, I felt two things. One, I felt like Shaquille O'Neal, okay? Because she was so tiny. And the other thing I felt was that I was in the presence of someone who had walked with God. I was in the presence of someone who was anchored. And this past week, Jean pulled up her anchor and went home to be with the Lord. And we praise the Lord for that. She was our anchorite. And she was a blessing. Many of you, she taught when you were little children in Sunday school, and then she taught your kids when they were in Sunday school. She was a blessing to us. And if she could say anything to, write, to us right now, you know what I bet she'd say? All things shall be well. And all things shall be well. And all manner of things shall be well. Because now she knows the whole story. One of our elders, Bill Bass, is going to come lead us in a prayer just to thank God for Jean and what she meant to our church. And then we're going to get on with our worship. Okay? Thank you, Bill. Can you bow with me, please? God, we come to you now to give thanks for the life of Jean Jones. Jean was a fixture in this congregation as long as this congregation's been here, Father. And, uh, and so many people owe so much to Jean. She has taught hundreds of children of multiple generations. And, and God... It's just that her stories meant so much to those children that uh, every one of them has a stronger biblical foundation to their lives because of Jean Jones. And how do, you, uh, how do you ever repay that, God? We just thank you for blessing us with her. And she was also a blessing to, to uh, her contemporaries and to her friends here. God, how many, how many people did she help by ministering to them when they were sick and hurting? And God, she's just been a tremendous part of this congregation and, an, and an, a true anchor for us. 
God, we thank you for all that she has done for us. We thank you for all that she has meant. Uh, and, and all that time, she was driving 50 miles each way to get here, Father. And she was here every time the door opened. She was just a blessing. We thank you for her. We thank you for her family. We, we pray for them and their loss. We pray that you'll be with all of us, Father, as we have felt a loss too. And uh, help us to honor Jean by living our lives in service because she was a true servant. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We focused on the shame of the cross this morning as we begin a new series called Awkward This Week. So our worship and songs will be about the cross as we share together in worship. Let's take our offering. In Christ alone my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ. Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save, till on that cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of Christ I live there in the ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip on me for I am his and he is mine bought with the precious blood of Christ no guilt in life no fear in death, this is the power of Christ in me, from life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny, no power of hell, no scheme of man can ever block me from his hand. Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ I'll stand. There was one who was willing to die in my stead, that a soul so unworthy might Said, 
This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray. God, we're thankful for the bread and for the sacrifice of your son and for this time to remember him uh, and just the forgiveness that, that we get from that. And uh, we're just so thankful. It's his name we pray. sacred supper he took the cup saying this cup is the new covenant in my blood do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes let's pray again Father it's difficult for us to even comprehend how big you are it's difficult, Father, for us to comprehend the magnitude of your love. It's hard for us, Father, to comprehend that you would pay the price for our sins in such a horrific way. Father, help us to live lives that show gratitude. Help us, Father, to live lives 
that glorify you. And let this cup, Father, be the bond between us and you that lifts us up from despair. In Jesus' name. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by His own betrayed, the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. Silent as He. Stood accused, beaten, mocked, and scorned, bowing to the Father's will, he took a crown of thorns. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation. Poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, Hallelujah! Praise and honor unto Thee, Saint of Heaven, God's own Son, to purchase and. salvation when your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee now my dead is paid it is
the high priest carries the blood of animals into the most holy place as a sin offering. But the bodies are burned outside the camp. And so Jesus also suffered outside the city gate to make the people holy through his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp, bearing the disgrace he bore. For here we do not have an enduring city, but we are looking for the city that is to come. Through Jesus, therefore, let us continually offer to God a sacrifice of praise, the fruit of lips that are openly profess his name, and do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Be seated, please. This morning, we have talked about the shame of the cross, what that means for us as people of his. We have seen the suffering, and though Christ died for all, suffering has continued through the ages. We begin today a journey towards a goal on March 3rd, and that is our annual Hacienda of Hope contribution. And it needs to be said that there is much suffering in Ecuador. And one of the small things that we get to be a part of is easing some of that suffering, easing some of that pain by taking care of some children who desperately need it. Much like this passage has just shared with us, do not forget to do good and to share with others, for with such sacrifices, God is pleased. God is pleased with the work that's going on in Ecuador. And he's pleased with us when we continue to support that work and all the other things that we do. As we begin the journey again today, this year, uh, we have a special video with Justin and John Arieger, and we'll have some pieces of information every week along the way until March 3rd. I pray that you begin today praying and talking with your family about to what level you'll be able to contribute to this great work this year. So here's Justin and John. I actually grew up here in Ecuador. My family moved here when I was eight, wanting to protect and help people, and mostly children, that do not have a voice has always been something that's just been a driver for me. The cases that we're getting are severe sexual abuse cases, severe physical abuse cases, and, and neglect, where you know kids are shut in, in, in homes for days upon end without, without food and that kind of thing. All their family grew up this way. Their parents were for them. And so it's perfectly common to get beat with stinging nettles. It's perfectly common to throw, uh, throw kids in cold water uh, to lock them up. For us, it was initially, hey, can, we've got to protect these kids. We've got to take them out of the situation and let the children know that there is something different uh, so that when they become adults, they don't have to repeat these same mistakes. They can have a different reference point. They don't have to take the traumas with them. And, and that for us was a big deal, but we haven't just stopped there. One of our really cool pieces that we've been able to hear is that we work not just with the kids, but also with the families in a way that makes it where we're not waiting on this next generation. The seeds we're planting there, obviously that's gonna be really cool stuff, but we can make changes with families now. And for us, that's an amazing piece. And so we're about protecting the kids um, where they need to be uh, and also really looking at how we can embrace the families and show them there's a different way. And in this, that gives us the reality that we can show, show, show and share Christ. Be able to do community work, help people, but at the same time let them know who Christ is. Because that's, I mean, if, if we're not able to share Him, it seems kind of pointless. It's really the meat of, of how we move around with our families and how we move around with our kids. And we base that off of, uh, of Christ's love and um, the way that He looks differently at the world and the situations that are around us. And that changes the way that, uh, that we look at things and hopefully the way that our families do as well. So that's going to be March 3rd, uh, is our special contribution for Hacienda. Uh, that is the only foreign mission work that we're involved in. We, our sense is that uh, if we're deeply invested in one place, uh, and we're going there frequently, and they're coming to be with us frequently, and we're putting our attention, our prayer, our money, our time in that, we can be more effective. And so that's, that's what we do. And it has been a blessing to so many people. We'll have more about that later on, but as Lincoln said, be praying about what you can do.
uh, in, on March 3rd. Uh, our goal, $275,000. That is a lot of money, but we've hit that goal. We've hit the goal that we set every year. I have no doubt that we can do it again this year, March 3rd. Be praying about it. So we're beginning a new series, a message series this morning. It's called Awkward. It's a gift. And uh, I, I, there's going to be something in here, I think, uh, that will bless all of us. And there, I can guarantee you there'll be some things in here that will make you uncomfortable. Because look at the title. It's awkward. Um, and we're going to start this morning with the beginning. Actually, let's go back 300 years before the beginning. 300 years before Jesus was born. Um, Philip of Macedon was assassinated and his son Alexander took the throne and then immediately killed the people who had assassinated his dad and some relatives because that's what you did back in the day. And um, so the problem was that he was really young and inexperienced and some of the outlying kingdoms decided, you know what, with all the chaos going on, this is a good time for us to have our own little July 4th. So we'll just declare our independence because they're too busy trying to figure things out in the capital. Well, Alexander didn't like that. And his counselors said, why don't we use diplomacy to figure out how to bring these people back into the fold? And Alexander said, no, I'd rather use the army. So he marched with 3,000 soldiers and put down the rebellions. And then he came back to the capital, consolidated his power, and said, that went so well, I think I'll mount a decade-long military campaign and conquer the whole world. And he never lost a battle. Not one. Not, he didn't lose, not, it's not that he just didn't lose a war. He never lost a battle. And he was always, always a long way from home and usually outnumbered, but he just wiped everybody out. The historians say that he is probably the greatest military general to ever lead an army. Uh, but he died in Babylon, uh, around 31 or two years old, something like that, but not from a battle wound. He contracted a fever or somebody poisoned him or we don't know what it was, but he died. There's a legend that on his deathbed, they asked him, Alexander, who do you want to succeed you as emperor of the empire? And he said, the strongest. Well, apparently they couldn't figure that out because four generals took over different parts of the empire and they fought each other all the time. And you remember what Jesus and Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided against itself? Well, the empire kind of folded up over time. But because of Alexander's conquests and his success, Greek language and Greek culture and Greek values were spread all over the world. And the things that Greeks valued were intelligence, art, beauty, Strength, glory, and honor. 30 years before Jesus was born, Caesar Augustus ruled the world. Actually, his name was uh, Gaius Julius Augustus Octavius. Everybody called him Octavian. Uh, and when Julius Caesar, his great uncle, was assassinated by Brutus and Cassius, were you in the play? In the eighth grade, I was in the play. Julius Caesar. I was Cassius. I wanted to be Brutus, but I was Cassius, so at least I got to stab somebody, right? So Julius Caesar's assassinated, and Octavian comes back to Rome. I think he was in Spain at the time. He comes back to Rome, and he runs into this political vacuum that's been left by his great uncle's assassination. It wasn't, Julius wasn't his dad. It was his great uncle. Julius adopted him kind of as his son. Octavian comes into this vacuum, but he's got two problems. One, he's 19 years old, no experience, very young. And two, the, the empire is ruled uh, by a triumvirate that included Julius Caesar, Mark Antony, and a guy named Lepidus. And so they form alliances and break alliances, these three, over the next several decades. And there's always civil war going on and everybody's getting tired of it. So Octavian finally says, you know what, I'm going to put an end to this. The younger guy, he's always thinking outside the box. He says, I'm just going to go buy Lepidus' army. Let's go buy his army. So I guess it was like the equivalent of uh, 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 27 BC eBay. I don't know how he did this, but he bought the army. And so Lepidus doesn't have any more power, so he just retires to a seaside villa. 
but he can't, Octavian can't buy Mark Antony's army because it's too big, and so he just conquers it. His navy wipes out Mark Antony's navy. Mark Antony flees to Egypt to be with his lover, Cleopatra. Did you see the movie with Charlton Heston, right? So he, he goes to Egypt, and he and Cleopatra are, are great for a year, and then Octavian says, you know, I think I'll take Egypt. So he goes down and takes Egypt. Mark Antony and Cleopatra drink poison and die, and then... Octavian comes back to Rome a victor. And they throw parades and they have celebrations and the Senate says, we'll make you dictator. And Octavian goes, no, don't make me dictator. Just call me the first citizen of Rome. Oh, and everybody loves him because he's not like Donald Trump, right? So then on 27 BC, he stands up in front of, Octavian stands up in front of the the Senate, and he says, I, I hereby give all of my power back to the people. Rome is a republic again. And everybody cheered, and everybody thought he was awesome, and the Senate said, we're going we're gonna to give you a new title. We're going to call you Augustus, the exalted one. What everybody didn't know was that he'd been passing laws and making policies and forming political alliances that gave him all the power anyway. So the first thing he did after he, he, he's named Augustus Caesar is to say, you know what we should do? We should, we should say that Julius Caesar, Rome's first emperor, was a god. Because there was this legend that when Julius died, this star ascended into the heavens. And that was Julius going to be with the gods on Mount Olympus. And everybody went, yeah, Julius Caesar was a god. And they made it so. They passed the law. And then Octavian goes, well, that's interesting because he was my father, adoptive father. That makes me a son of God. How convenient. And so he was. Now, historians say that Augustus Caesar was probably the greatest Caesar to ever live. And he would have agreed. He said, I found Rome a city of clay and I left it a city of marble. And he did. He was, a, he was a great leader in many, many ways. Ruthless, but he got a lot of good things done. And the, the Romans under Augustus valued exactly the same things the Greeks valued. Strength, power, beauty, art, intelligence, glory, and honor. So that's the Reader's Digest condensed version of the 300 years before Jesus, the empires of Alexander the Great and of Augustus Caesar. So that's how their stories began. How about ours? How did our story begin, the Christian story? Well, ours starts with an itinerant Jewish rabbi who was from a small country that was repeatedly conquered and occupied by foreign powers. He was arrested by his own people, tried, convicted, and crucified, and died a criminal's death. He died in humili humiliation, shame, and dishonor. That's how our story gets started. And that's awkward. It's an awkward beginning. Justin Martyr was a second century Christian apologist, somebody who defended Christianity. He, he described how awkward this um, beginning was. Not, you know, our, our story didn't begin with, with palace intrigue and promises of economic success and military power. Ours begins on the cross, and Justin Martyr says, here's what our critics say. They proclaim our madness to consist in this, that we give to a crucified man a place second to the unchangeable and eternal God, the creator of all. In other words, Justin says, because we worship a crucified Messiah, they think we're crazy. And Justin's echoing what something the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Paul said, here's our message. We preach Christ crucified. And the Jews think we're the Jews can't get over that. It's a stumbling block to them. And the Greeks think we're fools. This is the dumbest thing the Greeks have ever heard, that you would worship somebody who was crucified. When, when the biblical writers talk about crucifixion, notice this. 
They don't spend a lot of time talking about the pain of crucifixion. Now, we're interested in that, but they didn't spend a lot of time talking about it. Two reasons. One, everybody already knew how painful it was because they'd witnessed crucifixions. But the real reason they didn't talk about the pain of the crucifixion was because that was not the real, the real thing. The real thing was the shame of the crucifixion. Hebrews chapter 12 Verse 2 says, For the joy set before him, Jesus endured the cross, scorning not its pain, scorning its shame. Bruce Shelley is an editor for Christianity Today. He said, Christianity is the only major religion to have as its central event the humiliation of its God. It's almost impossible for, for, for you and me, for us, to imagine how awkward a conversation between a Christian and someone who was steeped in Greek and Roman values would have been. They would have, the people steeped in that, that tradition, that, that culture, would have grown up valuing strength and honor and glory. They would have known the stories of Alexander and, and, and Augustus. And now they're being asked to take seriously a religion based, founded by somebody who died in weakness, humiliation, and shame. Today, even the most ardent critics of Christianity acknowledge that a Jew named Jesus was crucified by the Romans in the first century. They don't, nobody denies that. Do you know why the skept, even skeptics of Christianity believe that a Jew named Jesus was crucified by the Romans? They say because nobody living in that culture would have made up a backstory that embarrassing and that shaming and that awkward. Nobody would have built a religion on that. So yeah, some guy named Jesus was crucified. They don't believe he, he's who he claimed he was. They don't believe he's who we claim him to be, but they believe that absolutely happened because nobody would make up a story that embarrassing, that, culture, that culturally out of step. So if that's how our story began, awkwardly, out of step with the culture, why do we think we will ever be in step with the culture? The meaning and the message and the very idea of the cross is always going to be unconventional, off the wall, and offensive. Now, here's the thing that I thought when I was working on this. I thought, well, yeah, but there was a time when the culture was more in step with the, our faith. And then I thought, that's true-ish. There was a time when our take, the biblical take on sexual morality and the culture's take on sexual morality may have been a little more in step. There was a time when kind of everybody went to church. I'm talking about in the United States now. I'm talking about in the South. There was a time when most everybody went to church and everybody had kind of a working biblical literacy. I remember that time. I grew up in that time. We never had ball practices or ball games on Wednesday nights or Sunday mornings. Never. You didn't do that. Businesses closed early on Wednesday afternoons so that everybody, everybody could go home and get ready to go to Wednesday night church. So you, you, you could look at that season in our culture's history and you go, well, we were kind of more in step with the culture then. But I grew up in Atlanta. And I remember that there were very few preachers in white churches who stood with civil rights leaders. I remember the fact that if you did stand with the civil rights movement, invitations to gospel meetings and Christian college lectureships kind of dried up. Oh, we were out of step all right with some biblical principles that all human beings are created in the image of God. The message of the cross has never been in step with culture, and it will never be in step with culture until the end. Maybe I'm a little fatalistic about that. The point I want you to see is, if you're going to follow Jesus, it's going to be awkward. 
How awkward? 2016, David Kinnaman and Gabe Lyons wrote a book called Good Faith. And as they studied our culture, they came up with a way to describe it. They, they called it the culture of self-fulfillment or the moral code of self-fulfillment. And, and here, here are some of the things that they identified about it. They said, that here's what our culture says. The best way to find yourself is to look within yourself. You should never criticize someone else's life choices. To be fulfilled in life, you should pursue the things you desire most. These are things that our culture believes. People can believe whatever, this one slays me. People can believe whatever they want as long as those beliefs don't affect society. Now, if you promote that, I guess you're trying to affect society, so you violated your own rule, but we'll leave that there. Uh, last one, any kind of sexual expression between two consenting adults is acceptable. You know, the truth is some of us probably believe that one. You see these messages everywhere. You are enough, look within, you do you, love yourself, find your passion, people are awesome. The cross of Jesus, this awkward cross, sends a completely different message. The cross says, humble yourself, deny yourself, take up your cross, lay down your life. The cross says you are not enough. The cross says you are not awesome, you are Awkward. We should probably talk about what that word means. Awkward. First time it ever appeared in print was in the 1500s. It comes from an old Norwegian word that means turned the wrong way. Awkward means turned the wrong way. And that's the message of the cross. People are turned the wrong way. Romans 3, no one is righteous. Not one. Jeremiah 17, the heart, that thing that you're supposed to follow, right? Follow your heart. Jeremiah 17 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and beyond cure. Mark 10, Jesus said this, no one is good but God alone. The message of the cross is that every human being is turned the wrong way. So not only did we get off to an embarrassing start, Okay, their leaders were strong and conquered worlds. Our leader died on a cross. We got off to an embarrassing and awkward start, but we've been given an offensive and awkward message to deliver. But wait, there's more. If Jesus' kingdom was instituted through weakness, humiliation, and shame, and if his message is all about self-denial, taking up your cross, following this culturally out-of-step leader, then being a part of his church cannot be about comfort, preferences, or desires. And over the next few weeks, we're going to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. Next week, we're going to talk about this awkward family. Hey, can you do me a favor? My email is jody at twickenham.org. You may want to email me from something else I've already said this morning. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but jody at, at twickenham.org, J-O-D-Y, would you send me the awkward stories about your family? I won't use your name, I promise. But I'm just, I, I, looking around at this church, I think, you know, some of us grew up in some pretty strange families. That's a conclusion I've reached. So, would you send me the, the weird things about your family, okay? I'll, I'll start with my own weird thing next week. We're going to talk about this awkward family. I'll tell you something about my family, and then I'd love to share some of your stories. And if you don't send me anything, I'm going to make something up and put your name on it, okay? <laughs> so next week, this awkward family, church is awkward because here's what, here's, what, here's what the cross does. The cross calls us to adopt as family surrogate siblings People who are not like us at all. And, and then it says this family commitment that, that I want you to make has to be stronger, deeper, and more lasting than any relationship formed through political alliances, demographic similarities, economic parity, ethnic heritage, gender loyalties, social status, sports allegiances. Told you it's going to get awkward. This right here, this family, 
is supposed to be stronger than any of that. That's what the cross calls us to. So we'll talk about awkward family next week. Then we're going to talk about the awkward loyalty the cross calls us to give to one another. See, if you're part of this family, you share your stuff, share your heart. And even when there is strife and disagreement, you work it out. We, we, we stay in this together. This, this culture advocates ditching difficult and inconvenient relationships. The cross-centered community does not opt out when things get tough. And then we'll talk about having an awkward conversation with our culture. See, we're missionaries. The cross requires us to live holy lives. So we're going to talk about what it means to be out of step with our culture's sexual ethics. We'll have to recover words like sin and repentance. Those are really unpopular words. But the cross has just as much to say about justice and mercy, about getting up close and personal with people trapped in poverty. This is not going to be a comfortable conversation, but our comfort is not more important than somebody else's eternity. So now if you're not a Christian, maybe you're thinking, this, this is exactly what I've been looking for a way of living that marginalizes me completely. Where do I sign up? Maybe you're not thinking that. But even though the cross calls us to a really awkward lifestyle, there's still something very compelling, very attractive about it. Something that even now people find almost irresistible and worth celebrating. A few years ago, a Milwaukee Madison High School basketball team met to play their rival, DeKalb, from DeKalb, Illinois. Madison's senior forward, Jontel Franklin, lost his mother to cancer the morning of game day. And so nobody thought that he was going to show up to play. Nobody expected him to, sh to show up and play. Star forward, senior, one of the last games he's going to play. His team's in competition for the state championship. So they're thinking, we need him, but... Totally get it. He won't play. Game starts. Midway through the second quarter, John Tell walked in, dressed out, ready to go. But there was a problem. Because his name hadn't been entered into the book, he couldn't enter the game unless his team was assigned, uh, 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 given a technical foul, two free shots. Both coaches... The, the opposing coach even went to the ref and said, ref, we, we, don't wanna, we, want, we don't wanna obey that rule this time. This kid lost his mom, we're totally good, let's let him play. And the referee said, I sympathize with you. I understand, I wish I could do this, but if we don't obey this rule, this whole game could get disqualified and that could hurt both teams, so we gotta go with the rule. You'll have to be fined a technical foul. So a kid named Darius McNeil, best free throw shooter, on DeKalb's team, volunteered and said, I'll shoot the technicals. So he stepped up to the line, referee handed him the ball, took a couple of dribbles, took his stance, and he shot a perfect arc that went about two feet and bounced out of bounds. And the referee picked the ball up, threw it back to him, dribbled again, another beautiful shot, two feet, dribbled out of bounds. The crowd on both sides erupted into a standing ovation for Darius. They asked him later why he did that. And he said, well, his mom died. This was the right thing to do. Look, there's a lot about Christianity that is awkward. There's a lot about how we began the cross. What an awkward beginning. The teachings, the commands, the requirements, what God calls us to culturally awkward. The conversations we're going to have to have, awkward. Still, there's something very attractive, very compelling about taking up your cross and laying down your life and putting others first and things like mercy and justice and sacrifice. They may be awkward, but they are good. And people know that. And here's the other bit of good news amongst all this awkward if you feel like you don't fit if you feel like a round peg in a world full of square holes 
If you feel like you don't have a place, if you always feel awkward, then you're exactly the kind of person Jesus is looking for because he was that way too. And then there's this. JFK was killed with an assassin's bullet. Marie Antoinette died on the guillotine. Cleopatra, whom we've mentioned earlier, died of poison. Jim Croce, Otis Redding, Patsy Cline, Ronnie Van Zant, all died in plane crashes. Karen Carpenter died of an eating disorder. Princess Diana died in a car wreck. Famous people have died in a lot of different ways. But you know, nobody venerates the bullet, the guillotine, the poison, the plane, the eating disorder, or the automobile. Jesus died on a cross. And the cross is recognized to this day, even in this age of limited biblical literacy, as a unique and important symbol of an event that impacted the world. If we are going to continue that impact, we will have to embrace the awkward. We will have to embrace the cross. Let me close this with a prayer. Let's stand and then we'll sing. God, help us to become comfortable with being uncomfortable. Help us to become at home in the awkward. Bless us to be people who live and breathe and speak the language of the cross. In Jesus' name, amen. Lifted up was he to die, it is finished was his cry, now in heaven exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior, when he comes our glorious King, all his ransom home to bring then anew this song we'll sing hallelujah what a Savior hey this is the part of the service where you stop listening and you start getting your stuff okay don't stop listening just yet okay give me one second Next, okay, you've been hearing us talk about this vision thing that we're working on, right? Next Sunday morning at 9 o'clock during the Sunday school hour, all of our classes are going to meet together, okay? All the adult classes are going to meet together in the gym, 9 a.m., do that the 17th and the 24th, both Sundays. I'm asking you to be a part of that, okay? If you don't normally come to Sunday school, okay, Come to this. Come, and I'm, I'm going to tell you right now, we are not going to feed you. No food. <laughs> Get your own breakfast. We'll have coffee and water. That's it. Okay? We could, here, here's what our elders could have done. They could have said, we're going to go off for a couple of weeks. We're going to come back with a vision and give it to you. It's not what they did. Our elders said, the Spirit can speak through this church, so we're going to let this church speak. This is one of your opportunities to do that. Next Sunday morning, 9 a.m. in the gym, we're going to meet and we're going to work through some questions together. And I need for you to be a part of that. I want you to be a part of that. Our leadership wants you to be a part of that. Next Sunday morning, 9 a.m. in the gym, everybody together. When are we going to do this? 9 a.m. in the gym. All right. Be, listen, come be a part of that. And if you're a guest, if you're visiting with us today, you got something to bring to that table too. Come, come sit with us. Come talk with us. That's next Sunday morning, 9 a.m. Everybody in the gym together will do that. The next two Sunday mornings, really important part of our vision process. Second thing, if you are interested in going to Ecuador this summer, you can meet, where are you guys going to meet? Youth wing. In the youth wing downstairs. Uh, for the summer Ecuador mission trip right after this service, correct? 
Youth Wing, Summer Ecuador Mission Trip. This, uh, that's a great trip. That's what the first video was about, Ecuador, our Ecuador mission. That's a great event. You should have been there. It's a beautiful place. Last thing, uh, other, there's a bunch of stuff in the bulletin, okay? Read that. Read that. It's almost time for you to quit listening. Almost time. Not one more thing. Okay, one more thing. Parents of teens or parents of people who are about to be teens, okay? A, we're praying for you. B, there's a meeting today at 4.45 uh, in the teen center. Meeting today for parents of teens and parents of kids who are about to be teens in the teen center, 4.45, all right? Let me leave you with a blessing. This is what uh, the priests in the Old Testament were supposed to say when they blessed the people. Seems appropriate for all of us who are priests here that we would say this to each other, and I hope you can say this to people this week as you go out as a missionary for the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Now you can stop listening. Have a great week.